Okay, should we call this thing to order? Thank you. Um, welcome, everyone, to Milwaukee. I'm Richard Gerson. I'm the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And uh, before I do my intro introduction, my more formal introduction to the conference, a couple of housekeeping items I just wanted to uh, run through. Uh, first, uh, after the plenaries today, there will be a reception and uh, book launch for our book, The Non-Human Turn, over at Soller, which is just right around the corner. It's um, heavy hors d'oeuvres and cash bar. The University of Wisconsin system won't allow us to buy you alcohol. You have to do that yourself. They will let us buy you food, though. So uh, we've got plenty of food. I was also asked by uh, Emily Clark, uh, to remind people that the food, all of our food at the conference will be vegetarian and vegan. And uh, she just thought that some of the meat eaters might be a little confused. And so uh, when they saw there was no meat, so uh, I just want to let you know that you don't have to wait for it. Uh, that, that food will be all vegetarian friendly and a significant portion will be vegan friendly as well. Um, also, just to remind you, on Friday afternoon, after the uh, breakout panels in the afternoon, we have a field trip to Innova, which is the art museum for the university. We've got a bus to take you down there and have a very interesting uh, event planned in conjunction with an exhibit called The Golden Spike, which is, refers to uh, the question about where, if in fact the Anthropocene is going to be a new era, where would we put that spike to uh, mark when it began. So anyway, there are a lot of really interesting exhibits there, and I really encourage you to come. Afterward, people are, are on your own for dinner on Friday, and there are plenty of places to eat in the area and uh, nearby. Um, also, uh, I want to start, and I'll probably end this way as well, with big thank yous to the center staff, uh, in particular Annette Hess, our office manager, John Bloom, who's our editor and jack-of-all-trades, uh, graduate project assistants, Nick Preferis and Kayla Payne. I'd like to thank also Gloria Kim, our C21 postdoc this year, who was served on the conference planning and organizing committee from the beginning. And an especially big shout out to Deputy Director Extraordinaire, Emily Clark, who is the person really in charge of the Center for 21st Century Studies. So a big hand for all of you. Now, the introduction, sort of both. So, on behalf of the Center for 21st Century Studies, I want to welcome you to Milwaukee and to this year's spring conference, After Extinction. As most of you are probably aware, academic conferences like this one customarily begin with a ceremonial welcome from a campus administrator, or as Chris Newfield says, we should be calling them manager, a campus manager, a dean, a provost, or even a chancellor or a president. Although the absence today of a presiding UWM manager was not intended in this way, it seems in many respects quite fitting on a campus like ours, where in a period of true political and budgetary crisis, many of us have felt that administrative leadership generally and support for the humanities in particular has been sorely lacking. So in lieu of such a ceremonial welcome from one of our campus managers, I'd like to begin instead by thanking the indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands the university occupies. Here in Minnewaking, there are several indigenous languages spoken, including Ho-Chunk, Menominee, <coughs> and Anishinaabemowin. Insofar as these three languages are still in use today, I want to say to those who came before us in this place, Pinagigi, Weyawena, Miigwet. The topic of the C21 Spring Conference has usually been developed in relation to the center's annual theme, which provides the intellectual focus for each year's faculty fellows and visiting lecture series. Thus, in 2012, our conference on the non-human turn emerged from the year's thematic question, what is 21st century studies? The next year, the center focused on the future of 21st century studies, culminating with a conference on the dark side of the digital. 
For last year's conference, the center created the concept of Anthropocene feminism to take up the 2013-14 annual theme, Changing Climates. This year's conference is no exception to this pattern. For the current academic year, the center chose its annual theme to support the declaration of 2014-15 as the Year of the Humanities at UWM, a designation which turned out to be more honorific than fiscal. To help fill out the Year of the Humanities, C21 focused its investigations on humanities futures. It was in this context that we arrived at the topic for this year's conference, After Extinction. In deciding on this topic, we were especially pleased that it could be taken as an ironic comment on humanity's futures, as suggesting the possibility that the humanities themselves could be headed to a future of extinction. Little did we know that in the course of the current academic year, it would not only be the humanities, but public higher education more generally that was threatened with extinction. While we've all been aware of the declining levels of state support for publicly funded higher education over the past few decades, it really was only during the last academic year that one could begin seriously to imagine the extinction of public universities in America. In Louisiana, the university system is being forced by a recalcitrant state legislature to make preparations for bankruptcy. In Illinois, a Republican legislator has proposed legislation to privatize all Illinois public universities in six years. And here in Wisconsin, Scott Walker's threat to eviscerate the Wisconsin idea's pursuit of truth, his proposal to cut $300 million from the University of Wisconsin system budget, and his and system president Ray Cross's scheme to transform the university system into a public authority also known as a public benefit corporation, contributed in a major way to the possibility of thinking the public university after extinction. In preparation for writing this introduction, I reread re the call for papers for this conference that we circulated last fall. I was struck with a sense of our innocence or naivete in the face of the coming catastrophic events of the past year. In addition to our ignorance of the intensified assault on public higher education that would soon be underway in Wisconsin and across the nation, we were also unaware of how the August 2014 shooting of Michael Brown by Darrell Wilson would catalyze nationwide protests and demonstrations against police violence towards black Americans. Last fall, we could not foresee how Ferguson would function retroactively to cast new meaning on earlier police murders of unarmed black men, like Eric Garner, John Crawford III, or Milwaukee's Dontre Hamilton, who was murdered by Milwaukee police officer Christopher Manny in Red Arrow Park exactly one year ago today. And unfortunately, conflicting with our reception, there will be <coughs> a, an action at Red Arrow Park to commemorate that. The unfortunate thing is the conflict. Um, nor could we have imagined then that Michael Brown's murder would be followed by a series of highly visible police murders of unarmed black men like Ezell Ford, Akai Gurley, Tamir Rice, Antonio Martin, Jerame Reed, Walter Scott, or Freddie Gray. If I was in a more optimistic frame of mind, perhaps I might be able to understand these murders and the widespread public outrage they've provoked as harbingers or forerunners of the extinction of the racist criminal justice system that continues to oppress and tear apart the fabric of America's cities. But I'm not really feeling it. Indeed, in the face of such events, I find it difficult to muster much optimism at all. Perhaps the next three days will be able to change that. We'll make it easier for all of us to think more hopefully about the possibilities that might emerge after extinction. So with that thought in mind, let's turn to the questions we expected this conference to address when we issued the CFP last fall and to what we might expect from the next three days. We began our thinking about the conference with a single question. What comes after extinction? In ongoing debates about the Anthropocene, this question has been very much present in relation both to the anthropogenic sixth extinction and to the premediated disappearance of humans as a species. Our predominant understanding of extinction today relates to natural species extinctions caused largely by human actions. 
But in the 21st century, categorical distinctions between humans and non-humans, or culture and nature, are no longer tenable, if they ever really were. Indeed, as Darwin was not even the first to note, mass <coughs> extinction events preceded the appearance of humans on the planet. The concept of species extinction first emerged in the 18th century to explain the discovery of fossils that had no living corals. Those fossils challenged predominant Christian notions of the great chain of being in which nature was understood as a complete whole created by God without gap or imperfection. If nature contained all and only those species that were divinely created, how could any of them be allowed to go extinct? Or how could new species emerge? Darwin's mid-19th century theory of natural selection treats the origin of species as reliant on chance and accident, not divine purpose, and therefore offers a fundamentally different understanding of extinction as part and parcel of the process of natural selection. Today, we think as well of the extinction of cultural forms, languages, <coughs> customs, and traditions, craft and artisanal skills, media technologies and operating systems, public institutions. In the face of this extended sense of extinction, asking what comes after is not only to inquire about the future of humans and non-humans, but also to investigate to what extent the concept's origins still inflect current understandings of extinction. Does the very concept of extinction bear traces of an ontology that's alien to natural, social, and human scientists in the 21st century? In asking what comes after extinction, then, we mean on the one hand to refer to the event of extinction. What comes after such events, whether local events like the extinction of a species or more massive events like the much-anticipated sixth extinction? If we think of these events not as destructive or final, but as generative, as what Whitehead would call occasions of experience, then what comes after these occasions? What comes next? Is extinction something that only happens belatedly after there are already species or forms or practices in place? Or does the very possibility of extinction work in a more radical form, as already present in the origin of species more generally? Is there a sense in which extinction might be prior to or even generative of the evolution or emergence of any form of life or being. In addition to the event of extinction, we mean also to refer to the concept of extinction. What comes after thinking extinction? Where we left after we're placed in the position, individually and collectively, of having to think about endings and what comes after them in the deepest sense of the term. What happens to writing, theory, and philosophy after thinking the concept of extinction? We designed this conference in the hope that we could also pursue the question of what it means to come after. Thus, we meant the name of the conference to encompass three different but related senses of the term after, of this preposition. First, in temporal terms, what comes after extinction? Are there historical models or examples of what comes next? Can these past extinctions measure up <coughs> to present day events? Or do the possible scales on which extinction might operate today make such comparisons incompatible? Is extinction terminal, or can species return, a la Jurassic Park, or European projects to restore the auroch, or Chevalsky's horse? Can dead or dying languages be revitalized? Next, in a mediational sense, we hope to explore what it means for an image, graphic, text, video, or film to take after the concept of extinction, to mediate it in such a way as to resemble or be mimetic of extinction. What would it mean to be after extinction in the sense of a, that a painting is after O'Keeffe, or a child takes after its parent? In order to be recognized as coming after extinction, an event or occasion must be seen as being related to extinction, to have been consequent or emergent from it. Thus, we hope to explore how future extinctions have been pre-mediated in a variety of formal and informal print, audiovisual, and networked media. What forms of knowledge emerge in such anticipatory pursuits? And third, then, in spatial terms, what will remain or endure physically after extinction? 
Extinction is not simply absence, but a geophysical event that occurs in space. How can one act at a distance after extinction in order to plan for, prevent, or preempt the end of crucial life forms by establishing seed banks, for example, or stockpiling DNA? How does the extinction of one species threaten the lifeblood of the entire biosphere? For example, the impact of bee colony collapse on particular flora and fauna, as well as on human practices like agriculture. Have new artifacts surfaced either as sentinels or fossils of extinction? For example, animal carcasses washed up on shore filled with plastic, or mutant plants in irradiated nuclear test fields? Even if extinction has always been thought of as impacting a larger ecology, has the scale of risk changed in light of the accelerated networks of the 21st century? So these are the questions that we hope to address <coughs> Uh, last fall, and I, I think we will be addressing over the next three days. But in thinking about this introduction and the context of where we find ourselves now, I want to add another question to this long <coughs> list of questions, one which emerges in light of the potential extinction events of the past year, and one that just <coughs> has been nagging at me, I suppose, as the run-up to the conference. So could it be possible that our current preoccupation with questions of extinction like our preoccupation with the Anthropocene in all of its variety, <coughs> could it be possible that this preoccupation represents not an engagement with the pressing concerns of the 21st century, but rather the opposite, a way of escaping, avoiding, or minimizing such concerns through the pre-mediation of anthropogenic climatological apocalypse? Might our fascination with the large-scale narratives of extinction and the Anthropocene prevent or distract us from taking up such smaller scale local concerns as the end of public universities or the racialized police violence across the US? I hope not. And I also hope that we'll consider these and many other questions throughout the plenaries, panels, and artistic events of After Extinction, and especially in the wrap-up session with which we'll end our conference on Saturday afternoon. For now, However, I want to invite my friend and UWM colleague, Kenan Ferguson, to the podium in order to introduce our first plenary speaker, William Connolly. Thanks very much.